in our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. We shall.
Ain't gonna let nobody do it. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody do it. Turn me round, keep on a walking, do it. Keep on a talking, do it. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Ain't gonna let segregation do it. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let segregation do it. Turn me round and keep on a walking, yeah, yeah. Keep on a talking, yeah, yeah. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse load him. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse. Turn me round and keep on a walking, yeah. Keep on a talking, yeah. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Ain't gonna let no nervous nilly load him. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let no nervous nilly load it. Turn me round, keep on a walking, yeah, yeah. keep on a talking, yeah, I'm marching up to freedom, yeah. Ain't gonna let you fit the Lord it. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let you fit the Lord it. Turn me round, keep on a walking, Lord. Keep on a talking, Lord. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Hang on a lead, may I kill it, Lord. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna lead, may I kill it, Lord. Turn me round, keep on a walking, Lord. Keep on a talking, Lord. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Hang on, I'll let no one for some unload it. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let no one for some unload it. Turn me round, keep on a walking, yeah, yeah. Keep on a talking, yeah, yeah. Marching up to freedom, yeah. Hang on, I'll let nobody load it. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody load it. Turn me round, gonna keep on a walking, yeah. Keep on a talking, yeah. Marching up to freedom, yeah. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's standing by the The union is behind us. We shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree. We will stand and fight together. We shall not be moved, just like a tree that's standing by the water. And white together, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We will be starting in about four minutes at 410. Thank you so much for being here. 
We have a few more folks joining us and then we'll get started. lost the dungeon shook and the chains fell off keep your eyes on the prize hold on hold on hold on That we did wrong was staying in the wilderness too long. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. The only thing that we did right was the day we begun to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, oh, sing it again. Hold on. Good afternoon and welcome to the 84th National Lawyers Guild Detroit, Michigan chapter annual dinner. I am Victoria Burton Harris, your MC for the evening, and I've been a guild member dating back to my days as a law student at Wayne Law. I currently serve as the Chief Assistant Prosecutor for Washtenaw County, but my Detroit comrades for whom I have a deep love and appreciation will always hold a special place in my heart. Before we start our dinner this evening, we have to acknowledge that uh, if we were in Detroit in uh, a physical space, that we would be um, in a building that sits on stolen land, the land of the Anishinaabek, Oriwa, Ojibwa, and Badawatimi. Before Detroit, the people named the place Wawaya Tunang, which means where the river bends. The National Lawyers Guild is grateful to the First Nations people of this land. May we unite in struggle and in strength. We must also acknowledge the stolen people, my people, African people. I honor today and every day, my ancestors who first began fighting for black liberation when colonizers entered their land, raped and pillaged it of its resources and its people, a beautiful people a resistant people, a people that despite every attempt to have our history erased, still live, still fight for freedom, equality, still love with every fiber of our being. African people built this country which has yet to realize our full value, our beauty, our leadership, yet we lead on. We are here today to honor many of the descendants of African people who have loved and led in spite of suppression and oppression. We honor our ancestors. We recognize and give thanks to the ancestors whose names we know and those who we don't. We pay gratitude for their continued communicative efforts with us, for their guidance on our healing and their acts to ensure our return to them, our return to ourselves. Give thanks for our communion, Ashe. Today also marks the 56th year of the assassination of Malcolm X in New York City 
at the Autobahn Ballroom on February 21st, 1965. The National Lawyers Guild honors the legacy of Malcolm X, whose commitment to freedom, justice, and equality has continued to live on in generations of freedom fighters, and specifically in the selfless work of the people being recognized this evening. I also must express deep, deep, deep gratitude to Marion Kramer and Maureen Taylor in Michigan Welfare Rights for their generosity last year when we could not have a dinner. Their generous contribution allowed the work of the Guild to continue and the fight for the people to continue this past year. And so for that, we say thank you. I am next going to call uh, to the screen our dear leader, Mr. John Royal, and as I was thinking about uh, introducing John earlier today, I asked a couple of guild members and board members, how long has John been um, our leader? And everyone said, gosh, as long as I can remember. And that's at least been for the last 10 years. Um, John is not only the leader of the, the guild chapter, but he is a friend and mentor to many, especially of us, uh, many of us younger lawyers. Um, who he taught us what activism really meant um, as an attorney. And John first got his start in activism as a freshman on the campus of Michigan State. He was an anti-Vietnam War uh, activist who uh, was arrested um, in attempting to hold a meeting to respond to the murder of activists on the, the campus of Jackson State. Um, John, he lives and breathes this work, even in his retirement, uh, when many would prefer that he relax and rest and enjoy the rest of his life with his wife, Marilyn, in their beautiful home in Charlevoix. John keeps going. John sends 50 emails a day. He responds to every call for assistance from our activists and organizers on the ground. And he's an invaluable resource, not only to our organization, but to our community. John, we love you and we also honor you today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 84th annual anniversary fundraising and a dinner of the, National, the Detroit and Michigan chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. I say this is a dinner because that's what we normally have, but because of the pandemic, we're not able to serve food for you this evening. So we instead hope that we will be able to serve food for the mind. Um, this last year has been an extraordinarily active year for our chapter. And uh, given the length of our program, I'm only given a few minutes to uh, provide my explanation of the state of our chapter, but uh, I will try to hit the highlights. If there's anyone who feels that they've been left out, it's not because I or our chapter board of directors are not aware and appreciative of the efforts you have made. I'm just not able to cover everything. In addition, in the last year, the global pandemic has made everything we have to do and try to accomplish more difficult. And so all of our people had to exert effort, eff efforts to accomplish all the things that we have accomplished this year. On May 25th, 2020, the Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd in cold blood. That touched off a national uprising against racist police brutality and police murders. On May 29th, this uprising reached Detroit and then spread across the state. Our chapter has taken the lead in providing legal support for protesters involved in this uprising. And I first want to give credit to our staff. A year ago, we hired Curtis Rene as our legal observer coordinator, and we hired Verbena Lea as our chapter administrator. They were both hired as part-time employees, but after May 29th, they ended up working full-time for a good part of the year. And uh, we could not have accomplished all that we've accomplished without their uh, diligent and hardworking efforts. And I want to express my appreciation to both of them for the work that they've done over the past year. In Detroit, the uh, Black Lives Matter protesters coalesced into an organization, Detroit Will Breathe, which is the organization which is tonight's honoree. This organization held a daily protest for most of the year until winter arrived and regularly called upon our chapter to provide legal observers. Fortunately, Dozens of law students and other activists responded to our call and stepped forward and volunteered to be trained as legal observers. Curtis Renee organized trainings and made them eligible. 
And uh, we also organized Know Your Rights seminars across the state for protesters to attend. When the protesters began, one of the changes in dealing with the police the last year is that we noticed both in Michigan and across the country that all of a sudden police were much more interested in arresting lawyers, guild legal observers than they had in the past. And uh, in fact, for the first time ever in Michigan, we had three legal observers arrested at different protests in Detroit and one in Kalamazoo. Detroit police chief Craig was asked about this at a press conference and he made the comment that if legal observers did not want to be arrested, they should not attend the protests. Well, he's not going to discourage us. We will continue to place our legal observers as objective observers of the blatant police misconduct and brutality that has been evidenced at the protests across the state. And we will not back down if this, at the uh, attempted discouragement by Chief Craig. Even more concerning is that both here and around the country, some of our legal observers have been physically attacked and beaten by police. And we are in the uh, beginning stages of, of organizing a civil lawsuit in federal court to defend the rights of our legal observers to observe police activity without facing physical violence. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a moment. In Detroit, the first five nights of protests were May 29th through June 2nd. On those five nights, over 400 protesters were arrested. Our chapter organized jail support in cooperation with other organizations, specifically with Michigan Liberation, which is a, the organization that is being honored by us tonight as our unsung heroes. And also we've worked together with a group called the Bail Project, a project of the Detroit Justice Center and the Michigan Solidarity Bail Fund. These organizations, we've all worked with them in cities across the state for arrests that took place across the state. As things developed quickly, we quickly realized we needed lots of volunteer attorneys. So we organized a coalition called the Detroit Coordinated Defense Coalition, which involved our chapter, the Detroit chapter of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the Detroit Justice Center, the Wayne County Criminal Defense Bar Association, Neighborhood Defender Service, and Michigan Liberation. This coalition organized and called for attorney volunteers. Over 150 attorneys have responded and are on a list to volunteer to provide legal support for arrested Black Lives Matter protesters throughout the state of Michigan. In addition, one of the interesting developments is that during the protests in Detroit, uh, it was the, the, well, first of all, the coalition agreed that our hotline phone number and Verbena Lea, our administrator, would serve as the hotline phone number for the, uh, for the uh, protests and uh, Verbena Lea would be the uh, administrator in charge of organizing the uh, protests who are, were, were arrested. Um, protesters began chanting the National Lawyers Guild hotline phone number so everyone would know what number to call if they were arrested or witnessed an arrest. Over, across the state, we have been involved in the representation of 446 arrested protesters in Detroit, in Shelby Township, Chelsea, Lansing, Grand Rapids, and Kalamazoo. The significant events in this last year was the August 23rd police attack on protesters in Detroit that I wanna talk about in just a moment. But first of all, uh, I wanna talk about the progress of the representation of uh, many protesters in Detroit. Uh, as we attempted to obtain discovery from the city law department in support of the defense of the protesters in Detroit, we kept facing roadblocks and had trouble figuring out what the problem was. Finally, we realized based upon various misinformation we've been provided that the Detroit police department, amazingly enough, had not kept track of the identity of the arresting officers for these protesters. And therefore the city law department was incapable of identifying who the arresting officers were and incapable of providing discovery regarding those particular officers. As a result, we brought this to the attention of the judges in the 36th district court. And we put the city law department in a position where they did not want to have judges suddenly dismissing large numbers of their cases for failure to provide discovery. So they have begun dismissing cases uh, uh, on their own to, so they can take credit for it instead of us. Um, so far, there's, well, there's 12 judges in the 36th district court who have protester cases. So far, we've gone through 10 of them 
At this point, 343 cases involving 246 protesters have been dismissed. That's just so far. There will be more over the next few weeks. We are still looking for arrestees who have not contacted us. If anyone who hears these words knows of someone who was arrested or comes in contact with someone who hasn't contacted us, please urge them to contact us. There are many people we understand who have entered into settlement agreements with the city that we believe were based upon fraudulent misrepresentations. We are prepared to go to court with those people and try to get their settlements set aside so they can get their cases dismissed, the same as the people that we're representing. Uh, in addition, the uh, National Lawyers Guild on its own has put together a civil lawsuit on behalf of Detroit Will Breathe. The name of the lawsuit is Detroit Will Breathe versus the City of Detroit. It's been assigned to Judge Laurie Michelson in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. And we provided Judge Michelson with videos showing vividly the brutality of the police attack on the Detroit Will Breathe protest on August 23rd, 2020 in downtown Detroit. Judge Lori Michelson was obviously horrified by the video that she saw and she issued a temporary restraining order on September 4th, 2020. And importantly, it's, it's a very important document. It's very well put together and I encourage everyone to try to get a copy of it and read it. Importantly, there have been no arrests of Detroit protesters since Judge Michelson issued her TRO. The August 23rd police attack on the protest was a, a, the most brutal attack of the year. It was, we have trained legal observers who are experienced who have observed police brutality. But the day after this protest, I talked to several of our legal observers who in there, and they were horribly traumatized, arrested and prosecuted. We were getting the dismissal of the charges against her she told me she had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of participating arrested and brutalized and seeing other people brutalized on August 23rd. Um, so this, the civil lawsuit is very important to try to obtain some justice for these protesters. In addition, the city law department has hired the law firm of Clark Hill to, and to prepare and defend a bogus counterclaim against the protesters claiming the protesters were engaged in a conspiracy to commit violence against the city of Detroit. Protesters organized opposition to the city council funding this uh, counterclaim and uh, almost succeeded. The, the motion to, uh, to allocate $200,000 to Clark Hill to, to litigate this counterclaim only passed by one vote. In addition, we have been together and we've organized together with, the co with a group that's become known as the Coalition for Police Transparency and Accountability. This group came together in the aftermath of the Detroit police murder of Hakeem Littleton on July 10th. It was pulled together by two elder activists in Detroit, Dr. Gloria House, who was active in the civil rights movement in Alabama in 1965, and a retired Detroit City Council member, Reverend Joanne Watson. This group is called the Coalition for Police Transparency and Accountability and uh, has put together a video, a slow motion video of the police body camera videos of this murder that showed that Hakeem Littleton was shot in the head at close range by a Detroit police officer after he had been disarmed and was being held on the ground and had stopped resisting. In addition, we are representing protesters in Shelby Township. The Shelby Township police have been especially racist in trying to oppose Detroit Will Breathe activists uh, we have five people charged with felonies in that county, 10 misdemeanors, and a number of civil infractions. Uh, efforts to, to put pressure on the government and the county prosecutor to drop the charges have so far been unsuccessful, but are continuing. The reaction has been uh, extremely racist. In addition, in Chelsea, Michigan, high school students organized a group called the Anti-Racist Chelsea Youth. They organized marches in support of Black Lives Matter. The police there responded antagonistically. They took pictures of everyone and then subsequently mailed out uh, civil infractions for impeding traffic. So far, they've sent civil infractions to 29 people, uh, 47 total charges that we're aware of. We helped pull together a legal team, including volunteers from the ACLU and the University of Michigan Law School Clinic. There's a motion to dismiss these infractions, which will be heard by a district court judge there tomorrow. In addition, this year, we, in our effort to extend our chapter statewide, 
we have been able to put together two subchapters. We now have a Northern Michigan subchapter that's centered in Traverse City and a West Michigan subchapter that's centered in Kalamazoo. Both these subchapters have been active in providing legal support for protests in those parts of the state. I've exceeded the time I was allotted, so I'm going to bring this to a close. Our website is being uh, rebuilt, restructured, and updated, so please check it out occasionally to keep, keep aware of what we're doing and the importance of the work that we're doing and how successful our efforts have been. I am incredibly proud of the response mounted by our chapter this year to the uh, to provide support to the national uprising. And uh, we have and will continue to rise to the occasion and provide legal support for the ongoing Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you very much for attending this event tonight. Okay, I, could. I guess I, I can start. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of the work you've done for the movement to help propel the movement forward. Um, as John explained, uh, there's been a min tremendous movement, uh, tremendous moves for the movement uh, over the last year. Um, and people have been coming together and, and to make that a collective effort. Um, all the avenues and tactics, direct action, everything that we have to do to do what we do in Detroit uh, to make the movement what it is has been a collective effort. And, you know, people all around the world have seen that. And people all around the world have bought into um, we can be free if we work together. Um, if we work together for justice for all. Um, and that starts with making sure that Black people are free. And I think that we recognize that here in Detroit. And we understood that the only way that we're going to make that true and the only way we're going to make justice true for all is that we make it happen ourselves in the streets um, on a daily consistent basis. And that's what we were able to do in the summer of 2020, in the fall of 2020. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So I, I, again, I thank you, NLG, for everything that you have done for the movement, for us in Detroit um, and around the area. And I'm excited to continue this fight with you all. Um, and like I said, this has been a movement that has caught wind nationally, globally, and that has been proven um, in this project that manifested from the movement. Uh, a group that is managed by a group in the UK um, called Inner City chose to spotlight Detroit Will Breathe's efforts for the struggle um, in their new project, We All Move Together, highlighting how you know we all come together and collective struggle with collective action, we can make great things happen for the people. Um, so this project was one that was really special. Uh, like I said, it was from inner city, Kevin Sanderson, who is the founder of Techno here in Detroit, uh, and Idris Alba, who was like one of the greatest actors you know, from the UK, um, did a lot of big hits. They came together to create this project, We All Move Together, and the video spotlights Detroit Will Breathe, and everyone who came together along with Detroit Will Breathe to make a major push for justice um, in light of what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and all of our brothers and sisters who are slain by the system. So again, you know, my name is Jay Bass. I'm with Detroit Will Breathe. And on behalf of Detroit Will Breathe and all of the organizers who, you know, NLG has helped, I appreciate everything that you all have doing, are doing. And again, you know, I am committed to continuing this fight with you all. So I want to show this project that was really special to work on. Again, it's Inner City featuring Idris Elba. We all move together. And again, they highlighted, you know, the movement in 2020 for justice. Eyes on suspect, black male, white jacket.
salute your soul because you chose life. The villagers are listening with innocence and mystery. You are now witnessing in a city history. We all grew together, together, together. We all grew together, together, together. We all move together. Hello everyone, I am Curtis Renee, the Legal Observer Coordinator for the Detroit and Michigan National Lawyers Guild. And I am so excited to introduce our five um, student honorees this evening. Um, they have been wonderful and have shown up um, during a moment where we needed them um, and have, um, just been just such an asset to um, the chapter. 
Our student honorees this year were vital to the National Lawyers Guild's movement support work. With enthusiasm, openness, and consistency, they were on the streets as legal observers and helped develop our chapter's ticket team, hotline, and caller interview team in response to the many protesters in need of our support. Student honoree McKenna Thayer is a master organizer who from the beginning of the uprising this summer was not only out in Detroit as a legal observer, but also was, a mobilize, but also was mobilizing more students to legal observe and to help with the ticket team, the hotline and caller interview team and any other background legal support work we needed. And photos taken one night by longtime guild member and legal observer Rashida Talib, McKenna can be seen next to a blue police bus holding her cell phone up to get the names and birthdays of police arrest of people arrested inside. Stooner Adenri Emily Van Barr was a lead legal observer in Detroit in early summer, taking on extra responsibilities before lead. LO was an official title. Skilled at developing creative infrastructure, Emily helped set up the Legal Observer Community Chat Thread as an LO support space at the height of the uprising. Later, Emily's keen attention to detail was extremely helpful with maintaining our protester database and for organizing our massive charts in the NLG behind the scenes legal support. Student, uh, student honoree Davi LeBoy became a legal observer in late summer and continued steady through fall. Davi stepped up consistently as a lead LO and was in Shelby Township on October 24th when the cops attacked several protesters and framed up the Shelby Five. Student honoree Brandon Wright has a wit and lighthearted attitude that soothes some of the harshness of one after another stories of police violence. Brandon and Emily conducted protester interviews, collected photos of injuries, and often had to find people for whom we had limited information. They both were able to pass on to other students practical and nuanced lessons that they from talking with survivors of police violence. For many months, Brandon, as a member of the ticket team, searched the online court system to track whether people's cases were filed in court, then what dates they needed to appear. Davi also worked on the ticket team. Ticket team was a tedious, long-term and vital task that helped hundreds of protesters, many of whom never received notice from the court. Our administrator, Verbena, came to rely upon McKenna, Emily, and Brandon to organize trainings, help draft and edit our interview scripts, and teach other law students about interviewing protesters who had been arrested. All three of them were always ready to reach out to more students for help when they saw the need. Lauren Perini joined the Wayne State NLG during her first weeks on campus and quickly became an inseparable and dedicated core member. Lauren is a gifted leader possessing equal parts, warmth, smarts, and incessive political analysis. One of Lauren's many gifts is her way with people. She is hilarious, outgoing, and warm. She instrumentally and she was instrumental in fostering community within our student chapter. The regular, she regularly opened her home to host student meetings and our chapter's yearly student retreat. Lauren also helped organize creative fundraisers for the student chapter, including a soup competition. Lauren was also involved in many campaigns during her law school tenure, including organizing countless panels, legal observer trainings, and doing legal observing herself, including in Lansing during the Poor People's Campaign. Finally, she was a leader in the student chapter's campaign 
demanding that Wayne State stop inviting immigration and customs enforcement to recruit students at the school's public service career fair. Lauren helped gather students, alumni, and professor signatures for our demand letter to the dean. Lauren is a fearless advocate and dedicated, move, and dedicated movement lawyer. We honor her and we honor you all. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I just wanna say thank you very much for recognizing me and all our other students at, and all the other students tonight. I think it's, you know, the Wayne State chapter, we've really done a great job stepping up during this. So thank you very much and over to McKenna. Hello, um, I just wanted to say on behalf of all of these incredible people, um, what an honor it is to have our names alongside the other people that you're hearing from tonight. Um, I am literally shaking. I just feel so overwhelmed with honor. Um, you know, when we're doing the work, it doesn't feel like you're making any big strides. So to be here tonight, kind of reflecting, it's been the most incredible year. Um, but I think what's even more powerful are, are the people who there's too many to list to honor tonight, um, especially from the Wayne NLG that we've seen. Anytime we had an ask, there were so many people we could ask and they showed up, um, especially these other student honorees. So I think what I've been reflecting on is just how powerful this movement is in the fact that there's, we can't see everyone that's here tonight, but there's just countless numbers that are out there. Um, and I think I also just wanted to say thank you to my other Wayne NLG members for creating a space that does not currently exist in law school um, to be radical, to push boundaries and to push back against the white supremacy that law schools hold up every day. Um, just like Lauren, I joined NLG right when I stepped on campus and immediately found a community of movement lawyers and radical lawyers who wanna do this work. And I guess my final thought that um, other than thank you is just that this is an honor and we're very thankful because none of the work that we would have done would have mattered if it wasn't for all the work that everyone else was doing. Um, we were able to do ticket team and arrestee calling because we had so many protesters in the street and we're able to learn about what it means to be a movement lawyer because we are watching people that are in the movement in our community push back against the white supremacy that plagues Detroit. So thank you so much for this honor. Um, and I just feel so lucky to be up here with these other names of students um, tonight and everyone else who's made this fight this year possible. The National Lawyers Guild, <clears throat> grateful for our legal observers. We want to take some time now and you'll see some names scroll across your screen um, to both uh, acknowledge and to thank them for their work. For over a hundred years, or I'm sorry, a hundred days, our legal observers were out there in the street, ready to document, walking alongside protesters. They are badass and they stood firmly as the police approached demonstrations in riot gear with tear gas, firing rubber bullets, um, armed as if they were in the military. Thank you all for your solidarity and your strength. The NLG was able to support organizers and protesters on the ground because of you. Our caller interview team, um, with the police arresting and hurting hundreds of people during the marches this summer, we had a lot of calls to make and to document people's experiences and to connect them with legal representation and oftentimes Michigan Liberation trauma support folks. And we thank all of you who volunteer to make those difficult calls and to document what really happened. The civil um, litigation team and the criminal representation, representation team we thank all of you lawyers who volunteered to represent activists. Um, we had a phenomenal team of lawyers uh, working on behalf of Detroit Will Breathe in their lawsuit against the city. Um, a massive legal defense of hundreds of protesters was also underway this summer. Um, many of those attorneys uh, are my close friends and some of the most dedicated and unrelenting criminal defense attorneys in the state. I wanna make sure I shout out my sister Shante Parker, who spearheaded um, you know, that effort and gathering those folks together. Um, new to Detroit, she asks, where do we go in times like this? Uh, where are 
the group of lawyers that are going to stand up and do this work. And lo and behold, we were already standing in the midst of them. Um, not only attorneys from um, NDS, but the phenomenal defense attorneys with the Wayne County Criminal Defense Bar Association, they stood up and they stood strong, 10 toes down, and they fought and fought successfully in Detroit. The ticket team, uh, students who organized and volunteered, uh, alerted us to many protester cases filed, uh, sometimes months after arrest. And because of the ticket team, we learned who had court dates, who were able to tell protesters um, and organize legal representation for them. Um, there was a co-chair of the criminal representation team, Deb Choley, um, who is here tonight, and I want to also thank her. Often, um, she said that she could only sleep, she knew the ticket team was checking on behalf of hundreds of protesters every day. Uh, the court system was not at all reliable in sending notice, but Deb made sure that the ticket team was on it. Um, the arrestee organizers, they um, collectively uh, encouraged and uh, put together uh, a defense group, which is not easy when you don't know many of the people um, out of hundreds of protesters who are being um, prosecuted, but solidarity was created and maintained and we were successful. Um, all attorneys, uh, we wanna thank you. Uh, you were on call for servers and um, were able to uh, be connected to jail support uh, folks involving the Michigan Liberation Jail Team and the NLG Hospital Detroit Will Breathe. And throughout the day and night, the on-call attorneys were available to answer questions and be ready for arrest and jail issues. And sometimes they came right off the street as legal observers and remained inside the jail building for hours with the Michigan Liberation Jail Team outside to make sure that protesters were released. So to all of you, thank you so very much. Next, I am going to ask that um, Alan Denard be uh, brought up to the screen. Alan is an organizer with Detroit Real Breathe and he's active with racial profiling across Eight Mile. He's also a professional musician. And Alan is one of the protesters who was arrested this past year and has since been represented by the NLG. Alan has a special gift for us. Hi, how's everyone doing? Um, it is such an honor to uh, be a part of this, and uh, it's an honor to be an honoree. Uh, uh, NLG has done so much for us, Detroit Will Breathe. Uh, you know, we're the direct action, but you guys are the legal action, you know, that we need uh, to continue this fight and uh, keep going. So thank you guys so much. Uh, and NLG for continuing to support us. And uh, we just hope that you keep uh, keep fighting this fight with us because, you know, this fight is gonna be an ongoing fight because we see the system that we're up against. Um, so I'm gonna uh, do a little rendition of um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is the Black National Anthem. But uh, I also have a song that I made uh, myself that I'm gonna do a, a combination of the two songs. Bye. 
Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, NLG. Uh, we need you guys. We need you all so much. And we are so glad you're fighting this fight with us. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much for that, Alan. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Next, I'm going to bring up, uh, well, I'm going to have uh, Marilena promote Bill to the screen. Bill Goodman is um, one of my fellow board members um, for the Guild, and he is also a partner at Goodman Hurwitz. Um, Bill has been in this fight his entire life, right alongside John Royal. Um, one of our leaders, um, another mentor of mine, um, as he is many young lawyers, and this organization would be nothing without his leadership. Uh, so with that, I'll have Bill promoted to the screen. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. That was uh, very kind and lovely. In fact, I, uh, I represented John and many others in that Michigan State protest that he mentioned um, involving the Jackson State and Kent State police murders, army murders, public murders. Um, and uh, actually, I have been a member of the Lawyers Guild uh, since 1961. Uh, I take little credit for the fact that I've uh, survived as long as I have, but I've been involved. I was actually the first student member of the National Lawyers Guild in 1961. Um, and uh, throughout that time, I have been involved in many intense, passionate fights that the Guild has waged, uh, starting with desegregation in the South, um, where dozens and hundreds of lawsuits uh, were started and protesters represented and people saved, uh, and many people who were not saved as well. And then the 1967 rebellion in the city of Detroit, which was an early fight against police brutality, uh, not the earliest, but an early one um, in 1967. Um, and that um, uh, uh, is still ongoing in many ways as we have seen and heard tonight. Then the Attica prison defense, the Attica prison defense, uh, the Detroit chapter was instrumental and deeply involved the anti-war struggles, as John has mentioned, and um, uh, the Michigan State protesters and thousands of other protesters throughout the state of Michigan and across the country. Um, all of these, uh, the newspaper strike, the uh, plant closing struggle, all of them the Guild has been involved in, but never have we been as intensely challenged and as boldly challenged by naked fascism as we are today. And you have heard the one amazing things that the Guild is doing, the fight against um, massive um, uh, police misconduct, starting with uh, illegal arrests, unconstitutional arrests, but also including uh, vicious and unconscionable police misconduct involving such tactics as uh, chokeholds, as rubber bullets, as tear gas, as uh, uh, just plain beating as handcuffing in unconscionable ways so that people's hands are going numb and blue. Um, all of these things are, are being fought by the Guild and they must be fought by the Guild. And our staff is stretched. They're doing an amazing job. Curtis and Verbena, incredible job that both of them are doing today. And they're stretched beyond limit and they need the help. And the Guild chapter needs help more than ever. We're growing but we are, are desperately in need of funds. And that is why I am talking to you here today. Um, you are able to make a contribution now. It's, it's essential that you do so. It's critical and it goes to the fight against fascism, the fight against police fascism and racism here in the city of Detroit. So all of you, please, if you can, click on uh, the GoFundMe link that I think is on the, um, uh, is on the uh, chat here. Uh, I believe Natalie Phelps sent it out and I don't know what's being shown here. That's probably another way that you can contribute, but please make a contribution right now. We have uh, a historic document that we are putting up for um, uh, bids right now and um, to make a contribution. 
And that is a 1987 resolution by the Detroit City Council with the original signatures of such stalwarts as Irma Henderson, Marianne Mahaffey, Clyde Cleveland, and uh, who else is on there? Barbara, Ray, Barbara Rose Collins and many others uh, for the amazing work that the Guild was doing at that time in the struggles against racism. Uh, and I think that was, uh, I, I, the ones that I, I missed the, in history, I apologize for, the New Bethel Church and the, the mass unconstitutional arrest of members of the Republic of New Africa. All of these things the Guild has fought has been right in the forefront and is more so today, more so than ever, more so a part of this movement, more so um, uh, building a diverse anti-racism movement involving um, everyone that can possibly be involved. And you've seen how many young people have been involved. I urge all of you who I've known over the years and those who I've just met and are, am delighted to have just met, please now make that contribution. Make it as, as, as often or as high as you possibly can. We need these funds in order to continue this work. It is a matter of desperate importance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Bill. And thank you all for your um, continued contributions that I can see rolling in. And it really does my heart well to see that. Thank you. So we are here for a very, very, very special reason. And um, both of the organizations that we are honoring uh, this evening um, are special to me um, for different reasons. And I am, uh, elated that I get to introduce um, our 2020 unsung hero, Michigan Liberation. Um, Michigan Liberation organized uh, this past year, many volunteers throughout the into the fall to do street team, jail team, and mental health teams. They did a lot of the initial and ongoing coordination, coordinating with the Guild and the Bail Project uh, to create a solid support system for protesters who were arrested. Michigan Liberation's work has been consistent, thoughtful, flexible, trauma-informed, and we believe life-saving. But they're also very special uh, because they organized the very first ever prosecutor accountability campaign this past year. Um, and I benefited greatly from that. We actually, we all did because they were very successful in that campaign in getting um, some of the most progressive prosecutors across the state elected in Oakland County and in Washtenaw County. I ran a progressive prosecutor race that they supported in Wayne County. And although we were not successful on election day, we were wildly successful in uh, shifting the thinking and opening the hearts of people across Wayne County, um, informing them of the injustice that uh, legal system and how it's anything but just. Um, the uh, prosecutor accountability campaign, it opened people's eyes and it started to get folks to ask questions about what their prosecutor did um, and how they could change um, what their prosecutor was doing to reflect their values. Um, the values that um, many of us hold, uh, values that people have value, that all people have value. Um, people uh, deserve opportunities to be redeemed and opportunities to not just survive, but to thrive. And they don't deserve the parasitic uh, system that we call the criminal legal system to feast on them. Um, that they deserve a just system and that we all deserve to live in safe communities, which um, the Michigan Liberation Team has helped to create. Um, the Michigan Liberation Street Teams provided basic necessities uh, this past summer to folks in the street who were marching um, they provided water, snacks, sanitizer, masks, flyers with the NLG number, and they provided attentiveness. Uh, the street teams, they paid attention to people coming to cause trouble with the Black Lives Matter protesters, including the police. Uh, the street team members de-escalated situations when aggressive people tried to disrupt a protest, and they became skilled at detecting danger. Uh, street team members were out every day and night with the marches and actions. And they were often the ones reporting who was arrested, which informed the Michigan Liberation's next layer of support work, the jail team. 
the jail support team was the most connected to the legal work of the guild. Um, when folks were arrested, uh, the street team and legal observers uh, would contact the NLG hotline and gather the names and birthdays of those arrested. And the jail team would then go to the jail and be there sometimes all night if they needed to be until every jailed protester was released. Uh, they worked closely with the guild and the jail team and made sure that the list of arrestees was accurate, uh, that the bail project was informed of how much money was needed. Uh, they made sure that people had support when they got out, food, water, warmth, a ride home, and overall just solidarity and love and support. Uh, Michigan Liberation's jail team, they photographed tickets and injuries and they got essential information so that the guild could then provide legal support. And that work, it was absolutely critical to connecting literally hundreds of protesters with legal representation, um, which ultimately led to the successful dismissal of um, the charges against them. An exceptional aspect of Michigan Lib's work in the uprising of 2020 and certainly in its other efforts was this deep commitment with the street jail and mental health teams uh, and it, they engage in a very trauma-informed, consent-based, social justice-oriented way. Um, they made information accessible. Um, they provided healing and other forms of support. We also saw the Michigan Liberation folks organize to free people in prisons and jails during this devastating COVID pandemic. Uh, we saw them successfully building a campaign to free grace um, helping gain the release of a black teenage girl in prison for not doing her online homework. And we saw their efforts to channel the attention and outrage from that situation toward ending the school to prison pipeline and toward nurturing and healing black and brown youth. We honor Michigan Liberation's clear commitment to centering and following the leadership from people who are most affected and harmed by the police and carceral state. And we're grateful for their willingness to struggle on so many fronts to end the criminalization of black families and communities of color in Michigan. We are glad to have been able to partner and learn uh, from them and we hope to do more of that in the future. Michigan Liberation, you all are an important force for the days to come. And I have so much love uh, and respect for you all, um, Nick, Ashley, Ray, Meredith, Alishava, um, Ali, Earl, all of you are family to me and to the Guild. And I just wanna let you know from the bottom of my heart that we deeply appreciate everything that you have done. We love you guys. Thank you, uh, Victoria. And thank you uh, to the National Lawyers Guild uh, for this great honor. Um, Michigan Liberation was formed in 2018, um, and we are a grassroots power building organization that centers people directly impacted by the criminal legal system. We know that people who are closest to the problems are closest to the solutions, but often furthest away from resources and power. And so it's a core belief of ours uh, that we connect folks to these resources and powers through organizing, through policy, through direct action, um, and most importantly, through leadership development. In a moment, I'm gonna pass it to Ashley Daniels, who was a 2018 volunteer turned organizer and one of the co-leads of the street team. But before I do that, I want to give many thanks, first and foremost, to the brave and courageous individuals who make up our street team, our jail team, our mental health support team, and our uh, remote teams. None of this would be possible without you. Uh, and that's why people-led work is so important. I also wanna give many thanks to the National Lawyers Guild, not just for this award, but snapping into formation along with the Bell Project, housed through the Detroit Justice Project for creating vital, vital protests infrastructure in under 72 hours that not just supported uh, the city of Detroit, but also served to uh, serve uh, the state of Michigan. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Ashley Daniels. Thanks, Ray. So May 29th, I remember that I call, got a call from Ray asking me if I was going downtown. And I'm like, what's going on downtown? And she was like, the protest for George Floyd. So I tell her I'll meet her down there. 
And as I arrive, I see hundreds, maybe thousands of people gathering around and listening to all of the speakers. At this time, I'm amazed. I'm in complete awe of all the people I see. You know, all of these people willing to risk the unknown disease because the police brutality and systematic oppression is a much bigger disease that holds so many black and brown people down. There was a mention on the microphone before we hit to the streets in March saying, don't do anything stupid, we don't have bail money. Ray turns and looks at Ash, we have bail money, we need to let them know. So we proceed to find those in charge and let them know. And as the march progresses, I'm feeling so much. I'm seeing so much. People are dancing and strangers chatting and hugging. There's so much joy around and a sense of community and freedom. People are letting fireworks off into the air. Cars are beeping and revving their engines in support of us in the movement. Bubbles are gently floating around in the air. People everywhere are walking and riding scooters, four wheelers. They're chanting, they're singing. We make it back to that stadium location, but the energy is still so high and full. People decided to circle back. Half left, the other half stayed. It's getting dark now. The traffic's getting a little heavier. I mean, after all, it is a Friday night in the middle of downtown Detroit. Those same emotions were transpiring, those same sights, the joy, the support, the songs, the fireworks, well, at least so one would think. The last boom that we heard wasn't fireworks, so it was tear gas. Now all the joy, love, support, and solidarity turned into survival, fear, anger, and chaos. All around me, folks are getting chased, maced, beaten, arrested, all the way to the wee hours of the morning. The next day, almost the same story, but now we have a few folks who are ready to support us and be trained as we try to bail people out and figure out this new process. By Sunday, we were able to recruit and screen over 100 people to support with bail and de-escalation. Now fast forward to June 2nd, what I refer to as a grasher takedown. That's where I first remember beginning to build out our relationship with Detroit Will Breathe. And together we were able to lead people by allow while allowing them to still have options. We gave folk rides to folks who didn't want to risk arrest. We passed out and wrote down the NLG number and flyers on hundreds of people, collected as many names and items of folks that we could. We de-escalated de situations if people didn't want to respect the Black leadership. Another day of excessive force and bad use of taxpayers' money, from helicopters to the drones to the tanks with the sound cannons on them. After another long night of bailout, bailout and triage, so to speak, and relationship building, we have just been building this plane as we fly it. The jail support team, the de-escalation team, political education, mental health support, and to the coalitions we've been a part of that seen many big wins. I tell these two stories to take us back so we can see how much work, trust, and growth we have achieved. And this is only just the beginning. So on behalf of Michigan Liberation, we are so happy, grateful, and honored to accept the award of Unsung Hero. Thank you for seeing us and believing us, and we're looking forward to our continued work of building the world that we Again. Thank you all so much for your work. And we are very, um, it is our honor to honor you, quite frankly, as our 2020 unsung hero. Next, I'm gonna ask that Sammy Lewis be promoted to the screen. Uh, Sammy Lewis is a birth worker, black feminist, environmentalist, and a dedicated revolutionary. Part of the LGBTQ community and an active member of Detroit Will Breathe represented by the NLG and Detroit Coordinated Defense. Hi, I'm Sammy Lewis. Thank you so much for that introduction and for having me here today to perform. Before I get started playing, I do want to say really fast, you know, everything that we're doing in this movement, of course, is important and necessary work as we fight for liberation. But it's also work that literally would not be possible without legal support. So thank you, NLG, for supporting us and for everything that you've done and continue to do for us. We love you, we appreciate you, and thank you so much. 
So now I'm going to be playing a song that I wrote. It's called Cops and Robbers. I wrote it inspired by both Tamir Rice and the events of this summer. Why is it consistent that black people get in justice from Africa to slavery to a mod arbory to Brianna and George. Casey and Andre, what we dying for? And Priscilla and Hakeem, is this more than I have a dream? Cause Dr. King, this is a nightmare. Being black in America, still my biggest fear. When's it start? Yeah, when's it end? How many more gonna wind up dead? And I know we fight for something more, but I wonder sometimes how long we gotta fight for. Cause it's easy to lose hope when cops can just kneel on throats and. Place my sister in a choke hold and run over my brothers till they don't move no more. You see the gas as weapons when we raise our voice. Beat us with batons like they ain't got a choice. But a choice is wearing a badge, not being black. A choice is shooting a gun when you know we ain't got one. Cops and robbers ain't fun no more Cops ain't heroes, they never were They always were the gangs and Murderers So, so good, Sammy. Thank you. So powerful and beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Next, I'm gonna have um, Amanda promote it to the screen. Uh, Amanda Ghanem is an attorney along with Jack Schultz, uh, who has taken the lead um, and been just simply phenomenal and dynamic uh, through the civil rights case, Detroit Will Breathe versus the city of Detroit um, that is in federal court. Um, and she has confronted the city's uh, brutality, uh, constitutional violations and racism. Um, and quite frankly, is, is a force. Amanda specializes in plaintiff side employment litigation, and she recently joined Pitt McGee, um, Palmer, Bonani, and Rivers. Um, Amanda? Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you again for being here tonight to support the National Lawyers Guild. Um, this is my first NLG annual dinner. I wish I was there physically to see all of you, but this is better than nothing. Next year will be better. <laughs> Um, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Nikia Wallace on behalf of Detroit Will Breathe tonight, just as it has been an honor and a privilege to work with them this past year and to march with them in the streets prior to that. Um, Detroit Will Breathe is an integrated youth-led militant organization fighting against police brutality and systemic racism in Detroit. The organization was born in the streets in the days after the murder of George Floyd. Um, the group developed uh, organically as individuals attended demonstrations calling for justice for George Floyd and an end to the practice of allowing police to kill black and brown people with impunity. As we know, in the early days of those Black Lives Matter demonstrations before Detroit Will Breathe even really existed as a group, um, Detroit police immediately responded with unchecked violence and brutality. In those first few days, thousands of demonstrators were tear gassed, pepper sprayed and beaten both before and after Mayor Duggan's implementation of an arbitrary curfew intended to silence them. That attempt failed, and as we would come to see, it would only be the first of many attempts by the city of Detroit to silence these courageous and resilient young people. As the people continued to march every single day, the group began to organize itself, choosing a name, voting on a list of demands, and expanding in numbers and strength. And as the summer continued, the people put their lives on the line again and again in their determination for justice. 
The radical and revolutionary love in the streets has been evident in everything from their protest chants to the ways in which the people took care of each other, like making sure folks stayed fed and hydrated while marching miles in 80 degree heat, and their commitment to demanding freedom for all oppressed peoples all over the world, from Detroit to Palestine. Uh, as John noted earlier, the attack on August 23rd was the most egregious display of rampant police violence yet. And even after that, beaten, bruised, and bloody, the people marched on, refusing to back down, remaining steadfast in their insistence that Black Lives Matter. Um, that resilience has been one of the most beautiful things I've ever been able to witness in my life. Detroit will breathe and 14 individuals who had been attacked by the police on various days subsequently filed a federal lawsuit with uh, myself, Jack Schultz, Sean Riddell, and Goodman Hurwitz as counsel. And um, we did obtain a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction prohibiting DPD from attacking and wrongfully arresting demonstrators and using like 24 different violent tactics that I can never even remember all of them off the top of my head to list. Um, but they're not allowed to do any of that anymore. So that's good. Um, the plaintiffs in our lawsuit now face a counterclaim for an alleged civil conspiracy. This is nothing more than the city of Detroit's latest attempt to silence this movement with frivolous and retaliatory litigation where they failed to do so with unchecked violence. Um, but I have no doubt that that attempt too will fail because I have seen the courage, resilience, and radical love contained in this movement. And I know that it is stronger than the forces of uh, hate, violence, racism, and greed that they're up against. I could not be more proud to be a part of this fight. I could not be more proud to be standing on the right side of history with this group. And I cannot wait to see where the movement will go next. With that, I am incredibly even proud to introduce, uh, I think Nikki is gonna speak, but I am proud to introduce everybody that's here from the Troy Will Breathe. I love all of you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, we appreciate that. So. <laughs> I'm just smiling because if we were all in a room together right now, um, the energy would just be palpable. And I know it, uh, just watching the videos and hearing everybody speak and really being able to reflect on this year. Um, so thank you to the National Lawyers Guild, Detroit and Michigan chapters for this award tonight. But even more than the award, uh, we want to thank you for doing the work of fighting alongside us and making it possible for us to fight in the ways that we choose and we determine. Um, so those of us who decided that we will fight at all costs against systematic racism and inequality, against poverty, against evictions, against the continued attacks against black and brown lives, uh, we did so in spite of the risk because we knew the risk of not fighting for ourselves and our lives and our dignities and the future of our children would be great, greater, much greater than the risk of arrest or charges. But what we didn't know at the time that we decided to fight was that we would have the resources provided to us by the NLG uh, and Detroit Justice Center and Michigan Liberation and other organizations. We had no idea the magnitude of lawyers and legal observers who were prepared to stand next to us in the streets, take our names and birthdays, track down police buses, figure out where we were being taken, document our tickets, our bruises, the harm being done to us, the ways in which we just continue to be attacked and hunted by the state and show up in courtrooms and defend our rights. We had no idea. So what happened in 2020 after George Floyd was murdered by the police was a national movement, the largest movement in the history of the United States. Many people have been in the streets long before this moment, but for a lot more people, this moment was a call to action. So across the country, people came out, people came out in mass to the streets. And here in Detroit, Detroit Will Breathe was formed. We are an organization whose leadership is largely made up of humans who have been active or participated in struggle in some capacity, but even then we weren't necessarily, uh, we didn't necessarily understand the magnitude of our organization or that we would be at the forefront of this movement. <laughs> None of us knew certainly how large 2020 would be. So last year was beautiful. It was filled with struggle and radical black love and figuring it out and jumping in and fighting hard. 
but it was also serious and political and militant. And we just refused to back down to bullies and badges, the goons they sent to do their dirty work, the chief outsider, Mike Duggan, old Jimmy Craig, and anybody else who identified themselves as an enemy of black and brown people. But throughout all of it, NLG was there and continues to be there as we fight this fight. On June 2nd, when we were assaulted and beaten on grad shit, and Tristan Taylor was charged with inciting a riot and questioned by the FBI, NLG was there. On July 10th, when DPD murdered Hakeem Littleton execution style, and then proceeded to tear gas a residential neighborhood, place me in a chokehold and arrest eight of us, NLG was there. On August 22nd, when DPD brought a war zone onto the middle of Woodward and again assaulted and arrested us and used potentially deadly force. Not only were they uh, attempting to stop us from exercising our right to protest, but they wanted to punish us for having the audacity to hold them accountable. NLG was there. On October 24th, when the Shelby Township Police Department attempted to use brutality and racism as a means of silencing us, the NLG was there. So while the most important part of struggle is the movement, the people who come to the streets and the people who are represented by the people in the streets, the victories of this movement have also been the victories of the National Lawyers Guild. The work you guys have done has been so important in giving us as organizers and protesters the means to continue to operate freely and to be able to fight on terms that we see fit and not the terms of our oppressors. So I can't tell you right now how many charges I have. I can't tell you when my next court day is. I can't tell you what I was being charged with, but I know who can tell you that, that's Verbena Lee at the National Lawyers Guild. And that's been really important to make the space for organizers to be able to focus on doing the work that we're doing and not have to focus on begging people to take our cases or trying to figure out the, the legal stuff. We know that when we walk into a courtroom, there's gonna be somebody there from the National Lawyers Guild on behalf of us. And all we gotta focus on is staying in the streets and fighting like hell. And that's been extremely important. So for DWB and others in this fight, I can't express what it has meant to us to not have to worry about that level of legal support. But also, in addition to defending us, it's meant that we have another way to fight, to hold the mayor and uh, the police and anybody else accountable. So when we launched our lawsuit, um, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, there are lawyers in the room. The language that I use might be incorrect, but you know what I'm trying to say. When we, when we were able to launch that lawsuit against the mayor and the police chief and um, anybody else who it's against <laughs> in that federal courtroom, it meant that we had another way to supplement the work that we were doing in the streets. And that's major because it resulted in one of our biggest victories so, so far which was the implementation of the temporary restraining order. And as John Royal said earlier, since that temporary restraining order was in place, Detroit Police Department has not made any single arrest of protesters. So this has been the work of the National Lawyers Guild and what they have made possible, what you guys have made possible. Uh, and we're grateful for this award. We're grateful for the opportunity to struggle alongside you. And we look forward to this year. Thank you. I don't know what's happening, but I can keep talking. <laughs> At this time, I'm expecting Jay to come on the screen and introduce a video. Is Jay still here? I'm right here. Okay, there you go. All right, yeah. Trey will breathe. Um, so I definitely appreciate that award and I echo everything that uh, my sister Nakia has just stated. When 
before being an organizer with Detroit Will Breathe, um, you know, I wasn't an organizer with anything. You know, in fact, my first march was during the summer of 2020. Um, so like I, I, you know, I was new to everything and I was trying to figure out where I fit in. You know, I didn't know, I didn't have any specific like, you know, skills as far as lawyer. I wasn't a lawyer. I didn't go to school, law school. I didn't, I wasn't a drummer. I didn't, I couldn't come and, you know, keep the beats up. Um, and I just, you know, I just, I was just concerned and I was, you know, fed up and I knew that something had to change. So I showed up and, um, you know, I didn't know how I could contribute, but I knew one thing that I did have was my voice. So I just used that. And um, more specifically, my music, my voice inside of my music. Um, Any time, all my life, you know, I've been, I've been an artist, I've been around artists. And I, I, from, from that, I learned to, you know, just put what I feel in music and maybe somebody could, you know, grasp to it or, you know, understand it or empathize with it. Um, and that's kind of what happened. I had no idea that it would manifest into chance and being able to put our message into chance and, and being able to put my energy into the streets and, and keep everybody motivated to keep going, um, and, you know, and have a presence. But but it did. And, you know, I was able to just keep going with it and create what I want to share with you all today. Um, two of my songs that was politically driven by um, the movement here in Detroit, you know, the uprising here in 2020, uh, in 2020 to combat, you know, all of the injustice that Blacks in the Blackest city in America faced. So um, I created J. Bass from there, just, you know, depicting what the ideal Detroit would look like, you know, if I was running it. Um, and we get that bozo Duggan out of the office and we, we make some real changes. And then another song, Fed Up, which, you know, I feel it accurately captured the emotions experienced by you know, people who stood up for what was right last year, um, we were just, we were fed up with it. You know, everything that was happening, Hakeem being executed and and police officers acting, acting with impunity, we were just fed up with it all. And now what we've been able to create is a mass militant movement that's ready to stand up anytime that injustice is present. So now um, I'm gonna continue to use, you know, my voice, my talents, whatever I can, to help propel the movement forward. And what I'm gonna share with you now is a depiction of that. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. So just as I say, we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around. We aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Cars, 
around so they never worry about the fridge. If I was mayor of my city, I'm buying everybody's scat pack. Make sure the kids go to school with new packs. Imagine having red sinners, it ain't not closed. Imagine cruising down the mile with no tie holes. Imagine crime going down because people are not broke. And when the crime goes down, we don't need cops. So I'm picking all the buildings that used to go to the cops for folks. Putting it on the block just so my people know what's possible. Came a long way, and we still got a lot to go. Long as I'm the mayor, we prepare for every obstacle. I'ma make weed recreation, though that's nice. Making sure your health insurance cover your whole life. Making sure the city don't cooperate with ICE. Get the fans out the city, we ain't taking their advice. If I got elected, I bet it won't be no drama leader of a free world. They respect me like Obama. Matter of fact, I'm a black king. They respect me like T'Challa. If I'm mayor of the city, baby, trust me like with God. If I was mayor of my city, I would take care of my city. Make sure everybody good, right? They ain't trying to make it fair in my city. They ain't trying to be in my city. They ain't trying to trap us in the hood. Beast, what we got? We gon' let up. Host why here we fed up. We gon' let up. Host why here we fed up. We gon' let up. Host why here we fed up. We gon' let up. Host why here we fed up. So take a deep breath. What's going on? I know it is wrong. Just take a deep breath. Gotta be strong and keep moving on. We gon' let up. Host why here we fed up. Sick and tired of being sick and tired When the hate gon' stop Getting to it over I ain't even driving I just pray to God It ain't no racist cop If I go to jail Don't even put me in a holding cell I'm finding out They really trying to trap me in the system Put me in a prison When I'm finding out Not me Young king But they trying to do me like a right knee Gotta find me I ain't hiding If you looking for me I'm in my streets With about three thousand people Who ain't leaving Till we get some justice I mean it if you think I'm blessed The police you know they can't be trusted So we gotta stand up for it United will never be the fight, they got a chance just for it, got a plan just for it. Looking at that budget like, fuck it, we gon' just abandon most stuff. We got a lot of shit that we can do with that. We can get some money to the school with that. Tell me, what you wanna do with some of you was black? We ain't got no rush to know we shoot a bag. We ain't gon' let up. Oh, squad here, we say what? We ain't gon' let up. Oh, squad here, we say what? We ain't gon' let up. Oh, squad here, we say what? We ain't gon' let up. Hey, 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 so take a deep breath. What's going on? Gotta be strong, you keep moving on. Hey, we gon' let up. Hold my hand, we fed up. We gon' let up. Hold my hand, we fed up. Look what they did to G. Look what they did to Bree. Look what they did to E. Look what they did to me. Hit me with tear gas, pepper spray to the face, and I couldn't see. Then the next week, DPD ran me over with an SUV. You know that they don't care about us. Anytime that you hear about us, they say that we violent, causing a riot. Okay, let me clear it all up. They don't like it when you telling the truth, and when your skin got that better than two, they want to silence that, so they gon' show it to your protest, right? Get shit looking like, damn, where the riot at? You know it's all part of their plan, but God's plan way larger than that. I've been working hard as I can, know what's coming, see it all in advance. Look, you know it's fake when they fall in your hands, and everybody right you all on the stand. Look, what it's gonna take is the people together, and you know they ain't to see us together. Look, we ain't gon' let up. Host right here, we better. We ain't gon' let up. Host right here, we better. Say what? We ain't gon' let up. Hey, host right here, we better. Hey. We ain't gon' let up. Hey, host right here, we better. So I'm taking these steps. What's going on? I know it is wrong. Just taking these steps. Gotta be strong.
Whole squad here, we fed up. Martin Luther King ain't lit up. He spent his whole life fighting for this. So I spent my whole life fighting for this. Black power. Thank you so much for letting me show that. And thank you to all the comments. Um, everybody liking it. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I'm gonna keep doing everything I can to help propel this movement and keep it going forward. Like I said, it's a collective effort. It's a collective struggle and everybody coming together, you know, adding what they can is what's gonna keep this movement alive. And this year we're gonna take it to the next level, the next consistent level. Um, everybody can get with me at JBass on all social media, J-A-E-B-A-S-S. -S. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Jay. I don't know about y'all, but I do feel like we are all in the same room. And I've, you know, these videos and the music, I'm feeling the energy. It's such a powerful event. Did not expect it to be this powerful because we could not be in the same space and had to do it virtually. But here we are, and I am absolutely moved by all of this. Thank you so much, Jay. Next, I am excited to bring to the screen Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, who will introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Hey, National Lawyers Guild family. It's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Happy 84th. I know this has been um, a bit of a difficult journey, but I think uh, so many of you have done such incredible work on the ground not only uh, supporting this historic uprising for Black Lives, but also making sure those that are the most vulnerable uh, have folks paying attention to their civil rights and protecting them in any way we can. So thank you all so much for your incredible partnership uh, these last few years. Uh, I also wanna congratulate Michigan Liberation and Detroit Will Breathe. Uh, Michigan Liberation, you have been so important in helping myself and my team fully understand the importance of ending mass incarceration, but also in working together to bail out mothers on Mother's Day and so many other really important restorative justice uh, measures and models uh, to again truly address our criminal justice system in our country. Uh, and Detroit Will Breathe, you are speaking for so many of us that can't always be out there with you, but you are doing an unbelievably courageous thing by standing up against police brutality and standing up in this continuation of funding uh, policing and uh, militarization uh, instead of really funding our communities and our neighborhoods, our schools, and so many other really important issues. So I want to congratulate all of you. I also want to take a moment uh, and welcome my dear sister, uh, Congresswoman Cori Bush. Uh, it has been an, a pleasure to have her become a member of the United States Congress. Her lens is so unique. Uh, her passion is felt uh, among all of us. Uh, and I cannot wait for all of you to hear her inspiring words to all of you. Uh, she represents a, a beautiful, a diverse community of Missouri. Uh, and she uh, has been really uh, upfront about the need uh, to making sure again that we truly defund police and invest in communities. Uh, and I cannot um, wait again for all of you to hear from her. And thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey, for caring uh, to share uh, your presence with us here in the city of Detroit uh, in Southeastern Michigan. And so I uh, really, really uh, cannot wait to continue to work with you in Congress. Welcome. Welcome to the community that raised me. Welcome to the community that taught me to speak truth to power. Uh, we are so incredibly proud uh, that you are in Congress and know that we'll always have your back. Thank you all so much. Take care. Good afternoon. My name is Congresswoman Cori Bush, and I represent Missouri's first congressional district. Thank you to the National Lawyers Guild and the countless organizers who made this remarkable event possible. Your tireless labor has not gone unnoticed. I want to start by telling you a bit about my hometown of St. Louis. St. Louis made me into the woman I am today. It nurtured me. It challenged and equipped me with a sense of purpose and confidence. And over time, it will come to vote me into office. It is the only place I have called home and for it, I am forever grateful. 
St. Louis is a city like Detroit that is struggling under the weight of crime and community violence because of poverty and decades long policies that have, le that have left our neighborhoods under-resourced and underserved. St. Louis leads the nation in police killings. Year after year, a heartbreaking and gut-wrenching reality that must be solved urgently and holistically. We are still living in the traumatic aftermath of the death of Michael Brown Jr. Six years ago, like many in my community, I was devastated by what happened. I became a leading activist in the fight for Black lives as an organizer on the front lines of Ferguson. I have been on the receiving end of systemic and racial injustice. The issues that are rife in our criminal legal and policing systems are issues we all know all too well in St. Louis. I have been tear gassed and physically assaulted by law enforcement. I have been stomped on by police officers. I saw friends and neighbors arrested and violence unleashed in our streets as law enforcement swarmed into Ferguson in 2014. I have watched loved ones die as a result of gun violence and police violence and have counseled and grieved with my community as our friends and family members and our neighbors became survivors of crime, violence, and police brutality. Remember, in the midst of all of this, I was in the streets. I loved my hometown so much and so deeply. It is out of that place of love that I needed to use my abilities as a nurse and as a pastor to care for my neighbors. I saw and felt the human toll of failed policies each and every day. I felt that. I watched that. Every day I found myself counseling members of my community who lost loved ones, who were traumatized by a punitive criminal justice system. We were living through the impact of years and decades of anti-Black policies. Like so many of you and so many in my hometown, I'm someone who has been out in the streets for years, putting my body, my job, my livelihood on the line day after day, fighting in defense of Black lives, in defense of our humanity and against racial injustice and white supremacy. My roots are in this movement. My heart is in organizing. In the streets of Ferguson, in my church and in my community, I started to reimagine this country. I started to reimagine an America that loved humanity, that cared for its communities. I came to believe deeply that we can remove police officers and metal detectors from our schools and invest in more nurses and guidance counselors. That we can fund housing and community-based services rather than criminalizing sex workers, the unhoused and those with mental illness and substance use disorders. I knew it was possible because I saw wealthy communities afforded these opportunities. I saw the ways in which investments in schools and health care uh, health facilities led to a more vibrant life. I knew it was possible that my ideas and our shared vision, it wasn't radical, it was possible. Informed by my work in the streets of Ferguson, I was called to action, now, not at all out of personal ambition, but because my community called upon me to run for office. So I ran and I ran alongside organizers, activists and loved ones who deeply believed in my vision for our community. One that was a shared vision. I ran with the support of young people who fought every day to be heard and to make their mark on the world. I came to Congress not as a politician, but as a politivist a politician and an activist. My activism informs each and every demand I make for my community in Congress, which means the marching, organizing and activism continues. 
It also means that I will continue to lead with radical love and compassion in partnership with my fellow committee members to ensure that we reduce harm and dismantle systemic and racial injustice in our country. Now, as a Congresswoman, I lead with intention on all matters, no matter the meeting I am in or the call to action I am leading, I will always bring with me the stories of my St. Louis community and every community that has been over-criminalized, over-policed and over-surveilled. I am so committed to building strong coalitions with movement partners and amplifying the voices of the unheard, the unhoused, incarcerated, over-policed, survivors of abuse, and the families, too many families who are fighting for accountability in a system that far too often fails to deliver justice. Our path to freedom requires that we work in partnership with social movements to help usher in change. Change that is so desperately needed in our institutions. But to do that, to do that work effectively and in pursuit of justice, real justice, we have to first acknowledge the limitations of our institutions and also see our role in the fight for liberation in an honest and clear way. Now, this doesn't mean that you should have to leave the law or throw your hands up in the air in despair. We're not saying that. As much as we want to do that sometimes, we know that our work within these institutions is crucial because if we step aside, how do we get the change? My job in Congress is to channel the will of the social movements that made me who I am and secured us this seat. That means ensuring that every legislative action is backed by and created in partnership with grassroots organizers. That means that it meets the demands of the movement and that I am held accountable by a broad coalition of people who organize in St. Louis for justice. And for you, I imagine the task is similar. Your role is to protect those that are victims and survivors of violence, pain and trauma of white supremacy. You are equipped with the legal tools to protect protesters who are wrongly detained and wrapped up in our court systems. You defend those individuals in our criminal legal system who are neglected and shoved into this punitive system with no mercy, none. No mercy. You lead national litigation in defense of our rights and our freedom, something that I cannot do. You do that. Your work is valuable. And let me say that again, your work is valuable and even more so when it aligns with the demands of our movement and the people closest to the issue. Our work has to reflect the work of those most impacted, most victimized, most traumatized by white supremacy. Now we have a seat on the House Judiciary Committee. We will use every tool at my disposal to support those impacted by a punitive legal system. We will center the experiences of those serving time behind bars, those whose families have been shattered by a criminal system that cares more about punishment than rehabilitation. Last month, we led our colleagues in a call to action to President Biden urging him to commute the sentences of the 49 people on death row. In a just society, the death penalty would not exist. We must do the most for those who have the least and ending this barbaric practice that would be an important step forward, a great step forward for our society. It is for this reason that one of our first calls to action was around clemency and ensuring that we decarcerate we must decarcerate our prisms as soon as possible. This call to action is particularly important amidst a raging pandemic that is making its way through our nation's prisons and jails, including those in Missouri. Last week, following an uprising at the City Justice Center in St. Louis as a result of unsafe and unsanitary conditions and the potentially deadly exposure 
to COVID-19 in that jail, we wrote to the mayor of St. Louis and requested full transparency and human rights protections for the men incarcerated at that jail. Like so many communities across the nation, St. Louis needs us to champion a public safety agenda that puts humanity over greed, justice over violence and righteousness over power. We did this after meeting with Arch City Defenders, after meeting with organizers for the St. Louis Action Network, and after talking to countless impacted community members who wanted me to meet with our mayor and to champion the demands of our freedom fighters. My being here today as a representative for St. Louis, it's not an accident. My office, our office, is a testament to the power of our movement and our demands. This Congress and this administration present an opportunity for us to hit the ground running in pursuit of our goals. We must meet this moment with open minds, open ideas, and open hearts. We need to be bold and unapologetic. Are you being bold and unapologetic? Ambitious and unrelenting because the status quo will not be dismantled easily. And we know that. We have called to defund police in mass incarceration and stop the surveillance of our communities. Despite the demands, despite our marching in the streets, our prison and jail populations are rising. Our unhoused and trans communities are being criminalized and our children continue to die at the hands of gun violence and police violence. The urgency to respond to these crises cannot be understated. They may laugh at us, ridicule us and label us radicals, but there's nothing funny or radical about saving lives. Our demands for justice and accountability are justified. Our safety and freedom will no longer be denied. I want to thank you for your tireless work to remind you that our vision for a better and more just world is noble and righteous and that I am here as your partner in this fight. It's the work that will lead us forward in our fight for a freer, safer, and a more just America. This is your work. It's work born out of radical love and compassion for each other. As you do this work, I am so humble and so privileged to be in this fight with each and every one of you. Remember, the work you all do every day is the vision for justice. The work you do to protect protesters like me, support organizers and coordinate networks, building and sustaining movements and transforming community demands into legal interventions. We thank you for that work. Our work is informed by our love for, for our community and our love for one another. We share a collective goal to defund, decarcerate, and dismantle systems of violence and oppression, to shrink the size and scope of our criminal legal system and center the dignity and humanity of all people. We will turn our vision for justice into reality because we have the power the power of each one of us working together, we will out strategize, out organize, and out mobilize anyone who stands in our way. Our, more, our marching orders are clear. We must galvanize our movement within the halls of Congress, in our courtrooms, and out in the streets. I pledge to do my part to push the administration and our party from the inside, and I need your help. We must mobilize and sustain our movement if we are to successfully translate our policy demands into policy actions. So my dear friends, this is our time, our political revolution. We will need to fight for everything we want. 
it will not be easy. It hasn't been easy. But we will get justice. We will save lives. And we will hold accountable those who abuse their power. I am committed to working in partnership with all of you to sustain our coalition of movement partners and amplify the voices of the unheard. If I leave you with one message today, know this. My office, again, is our office. This office is the movement office. It will be accountable to the movement and to the people. It will listen and prioritize our collective demand to do the absolute most for all of our communities, starting with those who have the absolute least. That's our work. I've been the least. National Lawyers Guild, our activism will not be passive. Our voices will not go unheard. Together, we will march forward in pursuit of justice and freedom and fight for a safer, freer, and more just world. We need you. Thank you. <clears throat> if after listening to Congresswoman Cori Bush, if you don't have a fire burning inside of you right now, a fire that makes you want to fully step into your role in supporting the movement for Black lives, the largest movement in U.S. history, I don't know what will set you on fire. Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will dismantle the master's house. Our generation has shown that we will not ask for freedom. We will not ask for oppression of our people to end. We will not sit quietly while our people are gunned down, run over by DPD police vehicles, tear gassed and unjustly prosecuted. Like Jay Bass said, we are fed up we are using our voices, our organizing skills, and our passion to dismantle the master's house, to dismantle systemic racism, to dismantle institutional racism, to dismantle criminal injustice. We will fight until we win. We will fiercely and boldly love one another while we do it. We will carry one another and hold each other up in this work. And we are unapologetic about our fight for Black liberation. We are demanding and dismantling it right now. And I don't know about you, but I am leaving so full tonight. I, I really can't tell you the difference between a physical dinner and this virtual dinner because this moment, this evening with you all and our speakers and the folks that we are here to honor and the work that we are here to honor, it has really been moving, powerful. I don't wanna to close tonight without thanking certain people. I'd like to thank Matt Robb. He put this together. He was the chair of this year's annual dinner. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention his father, a lifelong NLG member, Dean Robb, who has passed on. Dean Robb will be so proud of this virtual dinner, a powerful dinner. Dean Robb kept the Guild alive during the McCarthy era. They always had trouble making the Guild an integrated group coming across as, quite frankly, white liberals during the late 60s. But today's dinner shows how that is changing. As a black woman and lawyer on this board, I am beyond proud of the work this organization has put in and the significant role it has played in the movement for Black lives. 
I also want to stop before we leave to acknowledge two powerhouses who don't get enough recognition, and that is Verbena and Curtis. You heard tonight, um, you know, protesters tell you that they don't know when their court dates are. They sometimes don't even know how many charges they have or what their charges are because they know that they have Verbena and Curtis on their side that keep things going like a well-oiled machine. And Verbena and Curtis, there is no amount of money that we could pay you as an organization, no, no words that we could adequately express um, or share to express our deep gratitude and appreciation for you. But just know that the work that we do to support the movement, it would be impossible without the two of you. So thank you so very much. I also have a couple of announcements before we end tonight. Um, tomorrow, February 22nd at 7 p.m., uh, Moratorium Now will be hosting an event, Fighting Police Terror and Repression. Um, you can find that event on Facebook. Our own Julie Hurwitz um, of the NLG board uh, will be speaking along with Sammy Lewis of Detroit Will Breathe. Also this year, the Buck Dinner will take place virtually. Um, March 13th is the date. Um, mm -hmm. You should be receiving an email from uh, Buck Dinner table host. And if you don't, feel free to email um, Verbena uh, through the NLG email and she can connect you with a dinner table host. Um, lastly, please do not forget to contribute if you can. Uh, to the Guild using the GoFundMe link. I believe it has been dropped in the chat several times. If someone can drop it again, you can also find it on our website and um, it will also be emailed out to you, uh, thanking you for attending the dinner. With that, I am um, going to sign off and ask that you uh, continue the work that uh, you have already been doing over the last year and love to you all. Good night. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. It is we who plow the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving mid the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Taken untold millions that they never toil to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever.
shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I. Good night, everyone.